All right, well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Molly Goforth. I am a cellist and a cello teacher. I currently teach at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette as a cello instructor there. And I teach a fairly large pre-college private studio as well. Uh, when I first moved down to Louisiana, I taught uh, strings at the high school level. And it was a fairly unique program where we had beginning strings for anybody who wanted to start learning strings at the high school level, all the way up to advanced strings classes. And I did that for about six years. Um, and so this presentation is kind of gonna go over what I do with uh, beginner students to get them set up. And this is things that I do before I put a method book in front of them. Um, and it's, good activities to do at the beginning of the year when things are a little bit chaotic, even for students who have played before. It's a good reviews sometimes for fundamentals. So go ahead and get started. The title of the presentation is Setting Up for Success, and it is a variety of activities and games for beginning string players. So, the first element that I start with when teaching a new uh, string player is the bow. Um, and this is because the shape of the bow hold and the strength of the fingers and the shape of the thumb and where to place the thumb on the bow is usually the most difficult aspect for, um, for students to master. And at the same time, if you don't if you're not able to hold the bow properly, it's very difficult to get a good sound on the instrument. So students end up getting frustrated right away if this element doesn't work. And this is also helpful at the beginning of the year because it allows students time to acquire an instrument if that's part of your program. It allows students time to um, get set into the right class if uh, scheduling is an issue. Um, and it's a good use of old and damaged bows. So for example, I keep all of the old and damaged bows that I, ha I acquire, and um, I take any that people are getting rid of. So this is an example of a bow. The, the screw doesn't work. It's got this like plastic uh, frog, it's not worth fixing, but it's a good tool to use at the beginning of the year even students who you don't know or trust to have an instrument yet, you can give them a broken bow and uh, it doesn't really matter if they break it. The other tool that I have is this wooden bow. It's basically just a dowel with a little frog here at the, um, at the end. It's a little bit lighter for students who don't have a, uh, who don't have a lot of fine motor strength. Um, and these activities are designed to be done in conjunction with introducing basics of music reading and posture. So um, setting up the bow hand, there's a variety of different methods that I have seen over the years. For students who have a, a difficulty with fine motor skills, like they're not able necessarily to isolate fingers, um, making the bunny shape where you uh, put the teeth of the bunny together and then raising the ears is very helpful for them. Um, doing activities where you have the bunny eating something is kind of funny. Um, the bunny can do a lot of different adventures. Um, just anything to get those fingers in the right shape and mobile. Um, my favorite method of making a bow hold, which is convenient in coronavirus times where you may be teaching on Zoom or you may not want to get close enough to a student to actually touch their hand, is when you actually have your hand draped like this, placing the pinky in this corner here for cello, um, and then draping the other fingers over and plugging the thumb in at the, at the back. And 
giving students those landmarks of a corner here, feeling this part of the frog, the feral, and curling first finger, seems to help them replicate this on their own. For a violin, it would be a violin and viola, it would be a little bit different where you would place the pinky up and then be a little bit more on your fingertips as you're doing it. Um, for double bass, I teach this bow hold, um, but you could do a similar thing for the German bow. Um, for very young students or students who have um, maybe a disability or their fine motor skills are really um, underdeveloped, I do occasionally have students hold with their thumb under, or another option would be having students start with a bow hold at the balance point, but I find this is confusing to many students because there's no landmarks. You're just holding onto a stick. There's nothing to help you place your fingers. Um, and I see there's one other person in here. So um, if you would at this time like to share anything that you do, if you do anything different with a bow hold, you'd welcome any comments that you have about what you do for the bow hold. Um, you can put that into chat. Uh, but that is what I do. Um, another thing you can see here is these girls, they are all beginner students, elementary students. And the, um, the girl on the left, you'll see she has a kind of decorated cup there. And this is a, a fun activity that I do where you put a cup on top of the bow and then the students have to pass the cup to one another. And just to make it a little bit more fun, I, I put some hair and wiggly eyes on the cup. Okay, so here are some activities to do. And when I'm teaching a student a bow hold, I try and keep the bow straight up and down in a vertical position for probably at least a week trying to avoid this tipping, which would cause the fingers to slide around. So um, the first activity I often do once they've got their bow hold is a finger tap, just literally lifting the fingers, tapping them in their place. And this way, if you lift your fingers and your fingers are kind of like in the wrong spot, like if they're crunched together like this, when you lift and tap, they'll naturally go to a more ergonomic position and spread themselves out, or if they're too spread, they'll come together. Then, once the students can tap their fingers without the bow wiggling all over the place and losing control, I usually introduce this uh, spider game, which is fun in the fall as Halloween approaches. So the way the spider game works is you're gonna actually reach the first finger, reach second, reach third, pinky, and then slide. And continue all the way up the bow. If students have trouble moving their thumb, I often just have them do this activity where they rub their thumb on the back of the stick. And they can work their way up to the top of the bow. Um, I get very picky about making sure they're not just dropping the bow like this. They have to move their fingers. They can't use the other hand. And the same part of the finger has to touch the stick as it walks up the stick. And then for extra challenge, reversing this, going back down. And this, this takes students often five, 10 minutes. And you can have spider races as well in class. Um, even some advanced students uh, can take a few minutes to figure this one out if they haven't done it for a while. Um, another fun game for this is setting a timer for a minute and then either in partners or have the students hold with their opposite hand, seeing how many times they can get a correct bow hold in one minute. So students should be able to get at least 10 in one minute and probably many more. Um, if you have students who are really into 
games or rolling a dice. They can take turns rolling a dice and make bow holds for the, as many numbers as are on the dice. Um, some students are really interested in uh, getting a good picture. So you can have students take a picture of their bow hold if that's something that's allowed in your school. Um, that has the added benefit of you can send that picture home to the parents and the parents then know what to look for when their student is making a bow hold. Um, I described the pass a cup game on the last slide where students have a cup on the bow and then they would literally pass the cup over to the next person. Um, I'll show a picture of that here. The girl on the left has a cup on the tip of her bow. Um, then there's two excellent activities that I always do for students um, when, uh, when they're learning the bow hold. And these are from Phyllis Young from her string game book. And what is bow dancing? Where you put on a piece of music and the students actually have to make their bow move around and dance to the music. Um, and the other is bouncing balloons, which I have not done during coronavirus because I don't want students blowing up a balloon in class. And I worry what would happen if a balloon popped. So this has to be postponed until coronavirus is not a thing anymore. But you have a balloon and the student pokes the balloon with the tip of their bow and bounces it, and they can bounce it to one another. Um, sometimes students like to kind of bat the bow or whack, whack the uh, balloon kind of this way rather than bouncing it on the tip. And I generally allow that as long as they have a good bow hold. But this makes for a lot of fun. And then the final activity that I use very frequently, I call ghosts. And you place a tissue or a cloth over the top of the bow and they can move around the bow as if it's a, a ghost. Once students have a fairly strong bow hold vertically, I start tipping the bow over to develop the strength that way. So um, one of the things I do is students can either hold their hand out and tap their hand, or you can have a partner's hand where they tap. And similar to that is actually holding a drum and tapping the drum with the tip of the bow. And um, the drum tapping can be extremely motivating for students, especially if you have a variety of different size drums that makes different sounds. The students can experiment making different rhythms, different um, hearing the different pitch of the drums. Um, I often use the tapping of a drum as a reward for students. And so um, getting students maybe to do 10 bow holds and then they can tap the drum um, using it as a gross motor activity, placing the drum farther away from the students. They can do 10 bow holds or have a good posture or identify a certain number of notes. And then um, they can go tap the drum. Um, windshield wipers is a very common bow technique. You just literally do this. Um, motion that mimics a windshield wiper, you could, um, to get more repetitions of that, you can add a story, talk about when they went on a car ride when it was raining, anything like that. Um, I personally find windshield wipers kind of boring, so I don't use it that often, um, unless it's actually raining. Then uh, my alternative to the windshield wipers is actually hickory dickory dock. As saying that rhyme, hickory dickory dock, the mouse went up the clock and then wiggling up. And then the clock strikes and I actually tap forwards. So making this motion with my hand for striking and then coming back down. 
And uh, I extend this game by allowing students to choose a number that the clock will strike. So, um, for example, if they said the clock strikes one, then I might come up with the rhyme, the mouse had fun, and then we'd run down. Um, occasionally, students come up with a difficult number to rhyme, uh, in which case I invite them to come up with a rhyme of what they want the mouse to do, and then I don't have to worry about rhyming with 12. Um, I also have, uh, I also let students do a kind of bouncing test on one another, where they get a good bow hold, and they can bounce their stick or bounce the hairs on another student's hairs of the bow and kind of feel that um, elasticity of the hairs. This does require a bow that tightens though. So for example, this bow does not tighten at all and uh, would not work for that activity. Uh, a similar activity to that where you're feeling the tension of the hairs through the strings is called bow ninjas. So you have to have two people for this with bows. And basically, you put the bows together like so, and you one student is a leader and moves the bow around. And the goal of this game is to not let the bow slide like this as it's moving, to really keep the contact point throughout the whole activity and then letting students switch. A more difficult version of this is if students close their eyes and have to still keep their bow, um, keep their bow attached to one another. And a final game that I use often, and it's actually very popular with adults and young adults who are having to do a lot of things online and view lectures online, and they're just sitting there by their computer quite a bit, is called bow fishing. And um, honestly, I didn't know like bow fishing as in catching fish, like live fish was a thing, but apparently people do that too. This is not catching live fish. So um, I have an attachment here that attaches onto the end of this dowel bow and a string, and then it has a magnet. And so what you do is you lay out refrigerator magnets and you actually drop down and catch a magnet and then lift it up and see how many magnets you can catch. And this is good for developing strength because most of the refrigerator magnets are fairly heavy. And if you don't have an attachment like this or if you don't want to use um, uh, one of these dowel bows. You can just literally tie a string to the tip of the bow, um, just as long as that string has a, a magnet to it. And I just hot glued a uh, little wooden bead and a magnet together uh, to catch the catch the magnets there. Okay, at this point. Uh, once I've done a lot of those activities with a student and their bow hold is being developed well, I start uh, helping students find a proper sitting position. And um, for younger students, it's a little bit easier because they haven't spent as much time sitting poorly. But making sure that students have a proper chair that's not tipping them backwards and not cutting off the circulation in their legs, um, making sure that they're well grounded for um, for violin as well, violin and viola, even though those instruments you often play standing in the classroom setting, the students are sitting. And if their sitting posture is not set, then they're gonna be having a little bit of trouble holding the, the instrument. And as they progress in their development, of course, if their instrument is wiggling or if they are not holding the instrument um, uh, properly, then they are going to have difficulties achieving the results that we all want. 
So one of the things that I do with students is I actually assign them specific shoulder wrists and end pin holders um, so that the end pin holder for the class is always going to be the same length. The shoulder length, shoulder rest is always going to be the same height for them. Um, it's assigned to them. I put their name on it. If they lose it, they have to buy it. Um, but just kind of eliminating that variable for things that can go wrong. Um, for cello and bass students, I mark their end pin length with a sharpie. Um, if they're using their own instruments, then you only have to mark it once. If you have um, different classes that share the same instrument, I just get different colored sharpies and assign a color for each class. Um, as I'm setting up the instrument, I talk a lot to students about a uh, posture triangle. So uh, for cello, that would be where the cello hits on your, um, on your chest. Your back would be the back of the triangle. And then where the end pin hits on the floor would be the bottom of the triangle. And students can make um, more triangles where their knees touch the cello, where their hand touches the cello. For violin and viola, it is a triangle going down here. And the where that triangle is this way. And um, so discussing that, and that's a, a, a shape that even the youngest students can understand and start to get a good mental picture of. Um, so again, there's several people in the, um, viewing the presentation right now. So if you have any other methods or ideas that you feel like sharing, uh, I think everybody would love to hear that. Or if you have thoughts or questions, please feel free to type those into chat as we go forward. Oh, the other thing I was going to show you in this picture, you can see the student has a paper under his chair. And I do this for cello students, particularly so that on the paper, I mark where their um, chair legs are, where their end pin holder is exactly, so that they get the proper angle every time, even when I'm not there to make sure it's right. I know uh, in the Suzuki method, they often do this for violin students' feet for standing. Uh, I have not done that for violinists personally, but uh, it is a useful tool so I have a fair number of games that I do for uh, setting up posture with the instrument that don't involve actually playing on the instrument. Um, I have students hold the instrument and you can play a game of Simon Says. Simon Says tap your head, Simon Says uh, stand on one foot if you're standing. Um, and they have to keep a good instrument posture for the entire game. And this can be extended pretty much as long as you want in a lesson with students taking turns being Simon. Um, and most, even the youngest elementary students usually catch on to this game pretty quickly if they haven't encountered it before. Um, I do a lot of standing and sitting with students. Uh, this relieves the long standing, a long period of sitting that they do in a 50 minute class, if you're teaching a 50 minute class. Um, and it also just kind of resets the body. So standing up and then uh, usually I perform some sort of interesting motion to keep their attention. So maybe standing on one foot, maybe a small hop anything like that, and then sitting down and seeing how quickly students can get back into position. Um, kind of a corollary to that is developing a secret single for when to stand. So um, it could be like touching your nose, or I guess a mask if you're in person, touching your face, I guess. And then any time that I would touch my face, students would have to stand and then sit really quickly. And students get really, uh, they get a kick out of that to see who can stand up first. And, and they really watch you to make sure that uh, they don't miss the signal. 
So that's, if you're doing an ensemble class, that's also helpful for the idea of watching it conducted. Um, many method books and many different pedagogy classes talk about the importance of once you're sitting properly and you're holding your instrument properly, being able to touch the fingerboard all the way up and down. Um, that makes sure that the hand position is set up so that you can reach all of the instrument eventually. Um, and it also aligns the shoulder and elbow uh, for a proper playing position. And uh, one of my favorite ones is called ski jumps. And um, what you do is you kind of hug the strings with your fingers and you slide all the way down the fingerboard and pluck each string. So like the A string, D string, G string, and C string if you're playing cello, or the other um, E, A, D, G for violin um, sliding up. And I don't make a huge deal about making sure everybody's playing the same string necessarily, especially if you have um, uh, mixed groups with violin, viola, cello, bass, where they might not be playing the same string. Um, but you can extend that by doing little flashcards of which string to play um, if you want, um, just to kind of get that activity a little bit more time to settle in. I also have a, a song that sometimes I sing for younger students uh, for cello. Um, it's called the Ant Song. I, I guess I'll go ahead and sing it here. It goes, ants, ants, ants. And each one of those would be a pluck on the A string. Digging in the dirt, dirt, dirt. And a pluck on the D string. Underneath the ground. And pluck the G string. And then I say all the way to Cajun Field, because I live in Lafayette home of their aging pageants. But you can change the C to whatever you like, cello land, which would not work for violas, um, but any C location that you prefer. Um, the next thing I start to tackle when students have their good bow hold, it's getting developed, and they have a good posture, is actually developing strength in the fingers. And especially nowadays when students are doing a lot on a tablet or a keyboard and maybe a little bit fewer crafts and um, writing, even adult students don't have, uh, mostly don't have like super fantastic fine, fine motor skills and strength. Um, and also uh, there's a lot of people who have difficulty with mirroring. So um, we see this in exercise classes, for example, where the exercise instructor will hold out their right hand and they'll tell you left, you know, you're gonna hold out your left hand. So you're actually mirroring rather than doing the, the same hand that the instructor is doing. You're not holding out your right hand. So that's a difficult concept for many students. And it's something that I work on so that when they're watching me play or if they're watching a YouTube video, they're able to kind of flip that in their mind. Um, and then, uh, of course, developing the independence of hand from the bow in the left hand is an uh, important step as well. So uh, one activity that one of my students actually came up with this, uh, yeah, this spring um, because we were meeting outdoors for lessons and we needed clothespins to hold the music on the stand. Um, I was actually taking a clothespin, I have a miniature clothespin here, taking a clothespin and using the fingertips to open and close it and trying that with each finger. And I think almost everybody has clothespins at home, but they're not expensive and you can get a bunch of them and doing this little activity. And uh, it works for both hands. If somebody's bow hand is a little bit weaker, you can have that activity as well. But this is really good because you can show students the place on their finger where their finger is curled and where it's touching the clothespin is where you ultimately want it to touch the, the fingerboard. 
And you can extend this by picking up items with the closed pin. Um, you could also introduce finger flicks, which is just literally flicking the finger. You can do it in a sequence where you ask students to copy your sequence and assess whether they're able to move the different fingers in whatever order and also see what finger you're actually using and translate that to their own hand. Um, children's chopsticks are a good strengthener where you would use the whole hand to uh, manipulate those and you can again play any sort of picking up game. And a sequencing game where it's not flicking but just simply tapping the fingers. And a final thing that I do um, if the students maybe have played another instrument before or if I've already introduced music reading um, lines and spaces and different fingers is actually crossing the midline and doing the fingering on, its, on the opposite arm. And I actually do this similarly for violins because I haven't figured out how to really cross the midline for um, violins comfortably. But just like putting the proper finger down across the midline. So um, once the left hand strength is there, I um, always have the students hug the strings close to where the neck meets the body of the instrument and then keep that hugging feeling and sliding back into position. Um, then um, once the student's able to go back into position, I have students do left hand pizzicato, hopefully starting with their pinky, but if students are really resistant to that because it's very difficult, then I let them use another finger. Um, kind of holding that position and getting that strength. And I actually have a little video of, of this. This student is, I think, one and a half or two. And um, he, uh, he wasn't able to get his hand back in position for this video, but it shows you what, um, what he, let's see, what he was, what they're going for, let's see. Now, I think I'm going to share screen, if I remember how to do that. Okay, let me get this video set up. Okay. So I'll have to just share screen. All right. So this is that activity. So that is a, a pretty cute little video there of him uh, playing. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let me get back to the presentation here. Okay. Um, I also spend some time uh, talking about the strength of the finger being in a circle shape. And I have students um, perform an isometric exercise where they hold their fingers together like this, and then I have them bend their fingers and show them it's not as strong 
um, and really feeling where their finger is touching their thumb. Um, other things I do is I have students show me the lines where the string is uh, marking their finger. And uh, I also, for younger students, I tell them about calluses, which I call finger armor. And um, I tell them that it will protect their fingers, ultimately. Um, and in terms of hand independence, I spend several weeks um, doing quick brain gym exercises. Um, and if you're not familiar with these, they, uh, there's a wide variety of them on YouTube. Um, and they're pretty fun for kids of all ages to do. Uh, and for adults, uh, what I do is I introduce the exercise, but without a video. Um, uh, I also do activities such as drawing circles in opposite directions. I teach students to do that. And I start with a square if students have trouble with a circle. Um, I have a song that I use called the Swedish Cello Song where students tickle their left cheek and then move their arm, their right arm, to mirror bowing, just to kind of get the independence going as well. Um, once students can hold their instrument well and have a good bow hold, um, I have them start playing with the bow on the string. Now, I generally don't let students take home an instrument until they have gotten to this point. And I introduce playing the bow on the string before, um, before I let them take it home the first time. Um, this is because I think it's important for students to have a good tone or a decent tone so that they can replicate that sound and not get frustrated um, as they're playing at home. So with the bow on the string, I introduce a series of rhythms by rote on the opus, open strings. Um, I use Takatakatata or Mississippi River. Um, I let students pick rhythms, just anything to get the sound and clear articulations on open strings. I also um, have them start by setting their bow on the physically lower string. So on violin, it would be E, on viola, A, cello, C, um, bass, the low E. So they basically just sit their bow on the low string and they're always gonna rock up to the higher strings. And I spend a lot of time having students rock their bow across the strings without making any noise, having them trace the shape of the bridge with their arm. Um, when students have mastered that kind of string change motion and a clear sound on each string, I play a sort of freeze game where they rock their bows and then I or one of the students would say freeze and students have to perform a rhythm that you've assigned on that string where their bow is. You can also use dice again to plan string crossings where you roll the dice and that's how many times they have to do the string crossing motion. And um, pretty quickly after that, because students will be uh, eager to play with their fingers, I start introducing descending scales. So starting with the fourth finger, usually on the A string or third finger for violin and viola and playing a rhythm and then peeling the fingers off. Um, then, depending on the age of the student and the time of year, I teach them a simple song by rote, French folk song, Twinkle or Jingle Bells. Um, I think Twinkle is probably the best one because it starts with, the, there's no point where you have to add fingers, which causes bad hand position usually at the beginning. It's all taking fingers away starting with all four fingers, all three fingers, taking them away. But I do not make students who are over the age of eight usually play Twinkle. I usually start with French folk song for them just because they usually don't want to play Twinkle. 
Um, Jingle Bells is actually a good one to um, teach as well because it does have some tricky string crossings, but it does not have much where you have to add fingers. It's mostly taking away fingers. And everybody knows that song, so they can really learn it by ear. Um, uh, fairly early on in a lesson, I start to introduce music theory and reading. Um, one of the things I've been surprised about, even with adult students and adult students who have played other instruments, is that they don't necessarily understand very fundamental things about how to read music. Um, maybe just because it seems very fundamental um, and obvious that it wasn't explained um, explicitly and they just somehow made do. So these are the, the fundamentals I was referring to. Um, a lot of students don't understand right away that the lines and spaces in the staff are alphabetical. Like it goes A, B, C, D up the staff. Like a lot of students just don't intuitively understand that. And the idea that if you go up, that's going forwards in the alphabet. If you go back, that's going backwards in the alphabet. Um, somehow that's a, a, can be a challenging concept for students. Um, one thing that uh, one of my students uh, enlightened me about that I actually found hilarious is that um, not everybody looks at the circle part, the note head, to see the pitch. I guess they look at this, I don't know what they look at, but that's actually something that I explicitly explain now because, I mean, it's very difficult to read music if you're not looking at the note head. Um, and then noticing that the stem usually is what determines the rhythm. Like if there's one line connecting them, then it's an eighth note, etc and then showing them half notes and whole notes a little bit later so they don't get confused. I also teach students to notice when it's a very next line or space, steps, skips, if it skips just one, and leaps, and helping them figure out how to determine the note. And then I just do flashcards and drills, first starting with open string notes um, and rhythms. So at this point, once they understand all of those things, they can play a song or two by ear with good hand position, good bow hold, and good tone. At this point, I put a method book in front of them. And the method book is basically music reading practice. Um, I start in um, with the open string notes at the beginning of the method book. I usually skip the... Um, the beginning of most method books have a section where they just write actual letters instead of doing music notation. So I usually skip that part and go straight to the part where they introduce the open strings. I have students work on that with the bow. Um, and we usually do a page or two, if it's a daily class, a page or two every day. And for if it's a, a weekly lesson, I assign three or four pages for them to just read through and see how far they can get. Um, so this is what I do before I give them any reading or method book. And I will type into chat. I have a link where you can um, view the slideshow and I believe download it. So I'll put that into chat. And at this point, if anybody has any questions, comments, anything that they want me to address, if you'd like to type that into chat, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that. Still getting this going.
Sorry for the delay. It's having a little bit of a slow time loading. Let's see if I can find it. Ah, here we go. So if you would like to view the slideshow, uh, there is the link for you to view on your own. Okay, well, if, if nobody has any questions or comments, thank you all very much for coming to my presentation. Uh, I hope that everybody has a fantastic Thanksgiving break and uh, a good finish to 2020. Thank you very much.